Welcome to Our Own Voice, a partnership in mental health awareness and cooperation with NAMI Wichita and Kaysen Community Radio. NAMI is a national alliance on mental illness. We are the largest grassroots advocacy network for people with mental illness and their family members with over 800 national affiliates and 15 Kansas affiliates, with NAMI Wichita being one of those 15. We provide awareness, support, education, and advocacy for people affected by mental illness. Our purpose here is to provide a community conversation on Quezon Community Radio that provides insight into what it's like to live with mental illness. Our intention and hope is that our program will change attitudes, assumptions, and stereotypes about people with mental health conditions. My name is David Larson. I am very pleased and proud to be your host today, and I am a person living with mental illness. I am in recovery from major depressive disorder. Like everyone, I struggle with the ups and downs of emotions and the challenges of being fully human, but I am doing great, and I know I have many gifts to offer my family, my friends, and my community. And it is my pleasure to introduce our guest for today, Nancy. Hello, Nancy. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm okay. Good. Staying warm? Quite. Good. <laughs> well, uh, 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 is she telling me I need to turn the air conditioning <laughs> up? Is it getting hot in the room? Is that what you're it's saying? It's warm. That's Maybe. what I thought, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, Nancy, where did you grow up? I grew up in Wichita. I actually, when I was six months old, moved into the house that my mother was born in. And I did not leave the house permanently until I was about 37. Wow. When I moved out independently, I had times I was gone for school Mm -hmm. in between there. Um, It happens to be that my mom died in the same house that she was born in. She lived away from that house from about seventh grade when they moved in with her maternal grandparents or grandmother after her grandfather died and she moved back when i was six months old wow that is awesome amazing right well um what is your diagnosis my primary diagnosis like yours is a major depressive disorder that um is resistive to treatment it also includes anxiety post-traumatic stress disorders for reasons we really don't know, but all the symptoms are there. And um, there's some debate about some others. Uh, They've been rule out, rule out, you know, not sure if they're there, including attention deficit disorder. Okay. Um, Bipolar has been kicked around, but right now it's not in the mix because I tend to be depressed and I have manic states, maybe some hyper ones, which just means I don't get totally manic, but I get higher than what normal normally is. Mm. Um, Okay. Yeah. And then they have kicked around. um, Oh boy. I can't think of the right term now, but um, it is the old term would have been a fugue having fugue states where I kind of have a disassociate and have a couple of different parts that aren't very well integrated. Okay. Boy, that is a complex, complex diagnosis. Yeah, it's a fluid one, but the depression stays there. The major depression and dysthymia, which means even when I'm not majorly depressed, I stay in a low-grade depression most of the time. Okay. Feeling normal and happy and happy-go-lucky and like I figure everybody else do is kind of um, a rarity that I love enjoying. Well, let me let me jump a little bit here and ask you, when did you first encounter the work of NAMI? Well, again, that's going to be kind of roundabout. Um, when I was graduating from my undergraduate at WSU uh, in general studies with the emphasis in social work, I got a job in an um, agency that at that time provided group home for both people with intellectual disabilities and those who lived with a a mental illness. And so since I supervised that home, I got involved with NAMI as a 
professional. Um, in fact, I got invited to um, be vice president. NAMI was pretty new at the time. Um, in discussion with my boss, I turned it down because I'd also gotten offered um, a position on the ARC or the Association for Retired, Retarded Citizens Board, and that's the one I took. Oh, okay. All right. Well, um, we're going to talk more about that whole connection and everything, but before we go, I want to offer a thank you to our production team, to David Peterson, our executive producer. Thank you, David. You're welcome. And a thank you to our technical producer, Mike Padilla. Thank you, Mike. Muchas gracias. Wonderful. And this is our own voice on Quezon Community Radio, and we are going to take a quick break, and we will be right back. Welcome back to Our Own Voice, a partnership in mental health awareness in cooperation with NAMI Wichita and Quezon Community Radio. NAMI is a national alliance on mental illness. Our Own Voice is intended to humanize a misunderstood, highly stigmatized topic of mental illness by showing that it is possible and common to live well with a mental health condition. So, Nancy, um, talking about stigma, because mental illness has a lot of stigma associated with it. What can you tell us about your own personal stigma that you have had to deal with? Oh, wow. Um, I think stigma cuts two ways. One is what's directed to us from individuals, and the other is the stigma within ourselves. Um, for, for me, and I think for most of us, the stigma we have towards our own self is more devastating because it's more limiting. We are the ones limiting our possibilities and what we can do. I would agree. Um, so, and I have it because I go around telling myself, well, I don't have the face. I don't look like somebody who's mentally ill. But, you know, most of the people I meet look like me. So most people with mental illness don't look funny or act strange unless you can see below the surface. Most of us can kind of wear a mask and look whatever normal is. Um, and so, but yeah, I will find myself saying, oh, I probably shouldn't do that. It might mess with my depression. Well, some of that's true in recovery, you know, keeping in recovery. But a lot of that is out of fear, and it's my stigma fear about a couple of things. Sometimes it's about, am I going to backslide into my dark days, which I never want to go back to when the depression was the steepest? Or am, am I going to be censored by people around me? You know, and they'll see me as crazy for like I truly am. Or am I just not even trying because I know I can't do it? So stigma cuts a lot of different ways. Do, do you think that, um, that overall, all of us who deal with mental health conditions, that our personal stigma is worse than the stigma that's directed to us? Or do you think that there's sort of a 50-50, half the time the stuff directed to people is worse and half the time it's the personal stigma? Oh, wow. I don't know if I can put a percentage on it. I know that when I was first diagnosed, or let me back up, when I had my major depressive break, I'd been depressed before, and it cost me a lot of problems, but I never really acknowledged that. But when I had my big depressive break and went zooming to the depth of despair, I lost all but two of my friends. Wow. And a lot of my professional friends. I have my um, license, social work license as a... Uh, licensed clinical specialist, uh, social worker, so I can do therapy. 
Um, and I was working professionally. And so a lot of my friends were fellow social workers who I say should have known about mental illness and known it wasn't contagious, wasn't catching, that there isn't always a reason for why it, why it strikes that we know. But I lost all but two of my friends. and. I lost all but one of my professional friends and colleagues. Is it because they can't see the forest for the trees? In other words, they're so deep into uh, trying to help people that they can't understand that somebody so close to them is going through the same things? I don't understand that. I think it's a little different than that. I think it's more if I can have a mental illness, illness so bad and they had identified as being like me, that means they could have the same thing happen to them. They're not mm. safe. Interesting. Interesting. I, I really think that's a lot of it. And then I think there is that part that we just, well, now she's crazy. Now she's disabled and she's not competent. Mm. And having a mental illness it's not equal being incompetent or true, not true. being smart or not being able to be a professional. But in the job I had at the time, I work, was working behind the bars in a prison and I literally had, and they were all psychologists. I literally, I housed in one cell house and my boss in another and they used to carry paperwork to him all the time and all of a sudden it was like, well, if you can't do your job, then maybe, you know, don't need to be here. And that followed my hospitalization and returning to work. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So so speaking of, of your um, knowledge and everything, and we have just a few moments before we have to cut to another break, um, what is your official title right now? In my job? Yes. Or, okay. I work for uh, Cedric County Department, Division of Aging and Disability Services, and I'm a community resource coordinator. Okay, and I need to cut you off now, and we'll be right back with our own voice. If you would like to learn more about the National Alliance on Mental Illness and how you can get involved in mental health advocacy, please visit our website at nami.org. Welcome back to Our Own Voice, a partnership in mental health awareness in cooperation with NAMI Wichita and Kaysen Community Radio. NAMI is a national alliance on mental illness. So, Nancy, um, before our break, in, in the last segment, you mentioned that um, there were people who looked at you and said, oh no, is, is that contagious? Is, is that catching? And I just wanted to underline it. Thank you for mentioning that because um, mental, mental health issues, mental illness is not contagious. It's not something that you're going to catch. Um, and, and people do not need to worry about that out there in, in the cyber land or ether or whatever that we're talking to. So thank you very much for mentioning that. You're welcome. It's something I think is very important. Um, it was something that was devastating for me to have all those people disappear. Um, in fact, my therapist as a to when I said I wanted to make friends, told me to go to an art class, do something I enjoyed. And the first week was great. You know, we were all sitting there and we were painting. And second week, I noticed there was an empty chair next to me. And probably by the fourth or fifth, I was at the table by myself, which I dropped out. I mean, it was miserable. I was miserable. But, but is, does it mean that the, the, the people that you that you're around, that they just don't know how to deal with a person? Is that it? Or well, do you think? 
Well, as I got undepressed, as my depression kind of lightened, I realized I wouldn't want to be my friend either. I complained all the time. I was angry. I cried at the drop of the hat at (laughs) anything. And honestly, my hygiene probably wasn't the best either. And so you put that all together, and I never wanted to do anything. So you put that all together, um, it doesn't make for a good friend or... Uh, <laughs> so you weren't exactly putting the welcome mat out? Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. I also regret, because I said those same words as a therapist, and I went back to my therapist and said, okay, telling me to go to do something of interest is great for getting me out of my head, but don't tell me it will make me friends. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't. It will help my recovery. It's a good yeah. coping skill. Yes. Um, to do something that gets you out of ruminating about what's going on. Um, I'm convinced friends don't come until you start to recover, and let's not lie to people about that. Yeah. If it, if it happens before then, it's a blessing. But let's don't put in their responsibility. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. If you were trying to connect, you'd connect. That's my little soap opera about that. That's that's wonderful. Um, Thank you. I I do want to um, to uh, touch base with you about um, uh, since we were talking about friends about your your bestest friend. Oh wow, I have two best friends, and they're actually the two that stuck around. Um, my girlfriend Robin, who I only see like once a year, but I know I could call on her for anything. Um, I've known her since early childhood. Um, The other one is Diane, and she was not my best friend, but she didn't disappear. In fact, she didn't just not disappear. She started appearing more and more in my life. Even though she had multiple foster kids, and she had a partner as well that had her own struggles, She made time for me six or seven days a week, probably two to three hours a day, and that probably literally saved my life. If it didn't save my physical life, it saved my sanity. That is tremendous. Um, Between her, because she always saw and believed I would get better, and she's always that person sees the glass, Uh, Half full and not half empty. And then my therapist at the time actually used to tell me, I will carry your hope until you're able to carry it yourself. That is excellent. I need you to repeat that again. I will carry your hope until you can carry it yourself. Yes. And that was just so profound, you know, because there were times I was in despair. I was totally hopeless and I was totally suicidal Um, and it took every effort to not act on that I did a lot of passive things uh, driving crazy um, taking risk uh, probably actually my overeating is a way of doing that that I've done all my life okay wow but I love I love that idea of carrying hope for you uh, because I know in my own depression, I had the same same feeling that I there was no hope. And it would have been wonderful to have someone tell me, um, I'm carrying this hope for you. It was. I was truly blessed with my treatment team and with my two good friends and some others that I made. Well, I need to note this is our own voice on KSUN Community Radio. We are going to take a quick break and we will be right back. (laughs) 
Welcome back to Our Own Voice, a partnership in mental health awareness and cooperation with NAMI Wichita and Kaysen Community Radio. NAMI is a national alliance on mental illness. And David, I want to bring you into our conversation and ha- ask you to give us a number. I will give you that number, but first of all, I appreciate this beautiful music that you composed and brought in to, for our basically our theme for this show. Thank and I'm you. going to keep it Real quick today, 686-1373 is the number, but we want to get back to this very enlightening interview that I'm learning a lot. Yes. And uh, so, but NAMI Wichita, 316-686-1373, we have programs, we have educational classes, uh, we have support groups. Please give me a call. Give that number a call. It's an answering service. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. And give you some details on how you can get involved in some of our support groups, our classes, 316-686-1373. And the support groups and classes are all no charge. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, Nancy, talk to us about your view of meds and therapy. Okay. um, I think... In my case, and I don't think it's true for everybody, Fair enough. but medication and therapy have to go hand in hand. With medication, I think I'd only be partly in recovery. Um, without medication, I don't think I'd be in recovery near as much. Um, because what how I see it is medication took enough of the depression away that my total focus day to day was, or moment by moment, was not on keeping myself from harming myself. I had constant thoughts of wanting to hurt myself or kill myself. Um, In fact, I always believed I'd die before my mom. As a little girl, I had that belief. So I know the depression was there early. But the medications kind of took that um, away where the therapy then, I had enough cognitive stuff working that the talk therapy really, really started to work. You know, we not only focused on what I could do here and now in coping and, um, you know, mindfulness activities, um, taking care of myself, um, being kind to myself in what I say to myself, giving my per- myself permission to not be perfect. Um, it also helped me see and understand that depression, mental illness, is a illness. And it's, my therapist put it to me this way, it's like you're recovering from a serious, serious illness or major surgery, and your body needs extra sleep, so it's okay to sleep extra because that's when the brain does the healing of the mind. And so it was okay. She gave me permission to sleep maybe 13 hours a day. Yeah. As long as I was still getting it up, and eating and stuff because in my major depression I had quit eating I lost 60 to 80 pounds in a matter of 3 or 4 months Wow! and not realized it so you know not only did I have to focus on making sure I ate I had to focus then on other things but as I got better we could start to look at what thought process did I develop as a kid that maybe weren't working now for me? Mm. And so that really helped. Um, And today in therapy, we're still working on some of that, that I don't have to be perfect, that doing uh, good enough is good enough, that it's okay to not, it's okay to make mistakes. Yeah. In fact, one of the, exercises he had me do was to on purpose give the wrong change to cashiers so I could see the world did not disappear (laughs) because I was just terrified about making a mistake it paralyzed me Mm -hmm. and that was 
hard for me to do. But it was like all of them said, oh, I'm sorry, you shorted me a dime, or um, I'm sorry, uh, you overpaid me a dollar, you know. So the world did end. It helped. Um, and we're working on that truth-telling doesn't equal bragging, because in my family, we weren't supposed to toot our own uh, horn. Oh. So even though I'd done some wonderful things while I was younger, I couldn't call attention to myself. Today, I can. Today, I can say I've lost 75 pounds by eating healthy. Excellent. And that coping skill has been wonderful, that eating healthy gives me more energy, gives me better thought processes, help my sleep, which in turn is just this wonderful circle of cycle that goes up. Really fast, what is one coping skill that you use? And this is really fast. Being quiet, having quiet space. If okay. I could have a soundproof room, I'd love it. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us for our own voice on KSN Community Radio. Thank you to Nancy. And join us for our next Our Own Voice program.